Thank you for visiting this presentation for the East Ham Historical Society. Uh, I'm Thomas Ryan. I'm privileged to be speaking with you about Pastor Samuel Treat. Uh, he was the pastor of East Ham for 45 years, and he cared very deeply uh, for the Native American Masa people who lived here. When Samuel Treat's father, Robert, was young, the family migrated to Boston. And a few years later, moved to New Haven Colony. In their early 20s, Robert and neighbor Jane Tapp were married. And a year later, 1648, Samuel was born there in New Haven Colony. He grew up in a much revered household and most of Samuel's early schooling was at home with his parents, Jane and Robert. His dad would later go on to be the governor of Connecticut. In his late teens, Samuel left New Haven and came to Massachusetts Colony as a student at the 30-year-old Harvard College. His courses were all in Latin and they had to know both Greek and Hebrew. While famous as the school for future clergy, there were no courses one expects in a seminary, preaching, homiletics, liturgy, pastoral care, counseling, community leadership. So he was there in the late 1660s graduating in a class of seven young men in 1669. For sure, like students always, he heard of and was inspired by dynamic local leaders. In his case, Reverend John Elliott. From Elliott's nearby parish in Roxbury, across the wide back bay from Cambridge, Elliott was learning the Massachusetts language he worked long days with some Massachusetts tribe neighbors, uh, giving an oral language, an alphabet, a grammar, and a written form. Then he and his uh, Massachusetts colleagues translated scriptures into that native language. First, the Book of Psalms, then the New Testament, and finally in 1653, the whole Bible all just before Treat arrived across Back Bay in the neighborhood at Harvard. Student Treat learned Massachusetts from Elliot or his team. Elliot did not do this as a purely academic exercise. He was out there in the streets, in the hills, in the countryside, preaching in that language, informing communities of praying Indians. While uh, Sam was away at school, New Haven Colony was forced to merge with Connecticut. His dad led a group of dissidents who left to what is now New Jersey. There, these pious Puritans founded in 1666, New Ark, Newark. Upon graduation from Harvard, Samuel joined this three-year-old town and stayed in the area for three years. So 22-year-old Samuel, uh, filled with Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and perhaps some Massachusetts, was asked by Woodbridge, New Jersey, the oldest town near Newark, to be their preacher. He is still listed, as you see here, on that church's website as their first pastor. A few years later, Dad moved back to Connecticut, and Samuel came to East Ham. Almost 30 years prior, the Plymouth court set these boundaries for the town of Nauset, soon renamed East Ham. The land lying between sea to sea from the Namskaket River, now the Brewster Orleans line, to Herring Brook at Billingsgate and all the meadows to either side, which is the Wealthley Truro line now. East Ham was the only town east of Yarmouth and the Bass River until they became incorporated as their, uh, as their own towns, other settlements came under a sort of guardianship of the established town. So all of Cape Cod from Bass River to what would be called Provincetown was within East Ham. Samuel Treat arrived to a parish of that extent. And here's the things he saw upon first arriving. And how did Treat, reflect on this Native American sharpening rock, the Nasa presence here from time immemorial, and the many visible signs of their sustainability were all around him. And also this windmill, now in East Ham, 
started elsewhere a decade after Treat arrived. With such English type buildings, Treat was reminded that the newly arrived English were also establishing their own infrastructure of sustainability. The uh, home of the in-office governor of Plymouth Colony as Treat arrived was next door to Treat's. Prince was governor based here in East Ham uh, for one year, for another year after Treat arrived. One wonders if Treat enjoyed the fruit of Pence's famous pear tree right next door. Treat had, as part of his salary, a home built for him on 20 acres of land whose bounds were marked by stones such as this, one of which still exists. Notice the T carved into the rock. More importantly, Nasset, now East End, was at the very same time, two towns, two populations, two parallel governments, two parallel educational systems, two clusters of families with children maybe meeting, maybe even marrying. The Nosset, shown on this map by Champlain and their neighboring tribes on Cape Cod were in a definite majority in respect to the arriving English. We can wrongly think of the Indians as living in a village down the road from East Ham. Wrong. They were everywhere in large numbers with a few English having English style homes, later called Cape Cod style, sprinkled around. The aging governor and the new 24 year old pastor just happened to be by the same pear tree. The parallel government they represented grew more powerful and all encompassing. In the much older parallel society, Native Americans could not be sustained at the same level. Alden Vaughn over 50 years ago told in his book, New England Frontier of an old saying that the pilgrims and their successors fell first on their knees than on the Aborigines. Treat arrived in East Ham as an educated, experienced young Calvinist. In all summaries of his life, he is called the Calvinist of the most strict kind. Yes, the stream of 16th century reforms initiated by John Calvin in Geneva was represented by Samuel Treat. So the question of course is what is a Calvinist? Three replies, dense, diluted, and dressed. What is a Calvinist dense definition? None of us can do good under our own power. God acts first and mercifully welcoming us by grace so that we can acknowledge our total depravity and trust God's love. Thus in thankfulness, not in fear, we try to live according to God's will for us. Here's what happened actually, a diluted, diluted description of Calvinists. Treat was not a separatist rejecting the English way. He was from New Haven and Harvard and New Jersey, not a separatist from Plymouth. In 1648, as Samuel was born, colonists from around New England joined in a synod at Harvard and celebrated the coming together of their various beliefs and practices and victory over papists. For years, there were synod meetings where all New England assented to the same theology, strict separatist, strict Calvinist, and those hoping for a church of England definery were all sad at the seeming dilution by compromise of their particular traditions. Yet there was joy. The gathered clergy saw their grace assisted accomplishment, a unified New England as the first fully New Testament church since the reformers started trying 150 years before. Records show they say Revelation 19 verses one and two, quote, after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments for he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath to avenge the blood of his servants at her hand. And as they sang, they knew who the great whore is. 
Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for the Pope is gone, there are no Catholics. It's Boston, so we say Alleluia. What is a Calvinist? A third reply, dressed. To distinguish us, separate off the preacher, there was this guy, similar to academics and judges. And at the neck, two stretched cloth pieces called preaching bands, distinct from judges and academics. So there was a new Calvinist in East Ham. He was, he came as a single man, but not for long. Within a year, he married his first wife, Elizabeth Mayo. This is not her in front of us. Uh, we don't have an image of Elizabeth Mayo. If any of you watching happen to know where we can locate one, let us know at the East Ham Historical Society, please. With his first wife, who we don't see here, she died early after having 11 children. Uh, soon thereafter, Pastor Treat married Abigail Willard Estrabook, a widow up in Boston, uh, and together the, they had three children. And here she is in the style of the day. From his family, we turned to his meeting house and congregations. To qualify for incorporation as a town in 1646, the 49 colonists and their seven families needed the meeting house. We are told that the first meeting house was 20 foot square. Here's a scale model of the actual building. Could all 49 of them fit in 400 square feet? Today's standards for a seated congregation call for at least seven square feet per person. So allowing for a decent pulpit and some aisle space, the 49 plus a minister would just about fit. That first meeting house was beside Cove Burying Ground. I, was all, I have always understood that it was expanded a few times in floor plan and once by adding a belfry at Bell. The first expansion was 1678, soon after Treat arrived. The town record reads as if it was a total rebuild for a greater size. That's good because the town census as Treat arrived was 520 people. Think of that in 400 square feet. Never able to fit in church for the mandatory presence. So we could ask, how did that work for all those years? Something in our set of understandings needs to change. The church was much larger, but we have no record of that. Or a few came to church, a very few percent, low percent, not all by a long shot. If 50 fit and 450 in the census were left out, they did not put the 450 into stocks. This shows the town, the town and treat uh, added a bell tower. This is not the actual meeting house. This is a sample where they added the belfry with the bell, the first parish in the county or state with a bell. And by the way, we don't know where that bell is today. They probably allowed other musical instruments in that church first in Massachusetts. In 1646, this wooden beam was used in the meeting house on one side of the door. You see that darker wood uh, pen pushed up against the uh, wall. Uh, it, its twin from the other side of the door is also in the tool museum here in East Ham. We'll carry forward with other physical evidence of treat and his colonist congregation. There might've been some version of hymn books uh, since they probably restricted hymns to psalm text, these would have been called psalters. Or maybe each person used his or her own Bible, which had the psalms, of course. Uh, the adults must all have been literate, and the literate almost all owned Bibles, probably the Geneva Bible. Less chance that it was the King James, since that was the official church from which their ancestors wanted to be separate. All in the Treat family who were old enough would have had their own Bible. And Samuel Treat also had a family Bible that went to his widow and thence to one of their children. This photo is not the exact book, but Treat's family Bible 
It was about this size and has been located recently in the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston. A manuscript note on the front flyleaf reads, the Bible of Reverend Samuel Treat and of his widow, Mrs. Abigail Treat, and the Bible on daily use of Robert Treat Payne, signed Charles Payne, 1842. In the congregations of New England, printed Confessions of Faith <clears throat> contained summaries of what they believed and what they condemned. Treat certainly knew how to get the boat to Boston and records show him participating in many clergy meetings and synods early on and through the decades. One can see that he knew Massachusetts early on. So he assisted in the translation work for this confession book we see on the image in 1680. That early, it's unlikely he arrived in East Ham and only started to learn how to speak with the Nosset after he arrived. From the latter third of his years, we have Treat's cup or chalice, still another physical reminder after the meeting house of the books. We can see the inscription close up there. Ex dono gift from Mr. Jos Jos Joshua Bangs, Mrs. Hannah Bangs to the Church of East Ham, 1700. Several years ago, several decades ago rather, the early 20th century, a relative had it in her possession and says that the church gave it back to her family after the church was using it for generations. Of course, the church still exists as part of the Federated Church of Orleans. She then sold it to the Museum of Fine Arts for $3,000. The museum later sent it to Yale Art Gallery on permanent loan and it's worth many hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point. One can imagine Treat using it and its existence is a silent testimony to this strand of the Reformation, not ceasing the celebration of the liturgy of the Lord's Supper and allowing beauty to be at the service of the community. The silversmith Jeremiah Dummer, Dummer of Boston is now much appreciated for his pioneering work. And I can report to the church and to the town of East Ham that your chalice is on view in New Haven, the colony of Treat's childhood. It is displayed with a great collection of other dumber works. So those are physical reminders of his congregation, mostly the English congregation. He also developed relationships with and faith leadership with Native American, the Nasa tribe. Uh, here we see an early seal of the Massachusetts colony. And you can see there the Native American, you can see the scroll coming out of the mouth of that Native American. It says there, come over and help me. This is an exact, trans exact wording of Acts of the Apostles, chapter eight, verse 30. Come over to Macedonia and help us. So early on, the separatist pilgrims and the Puritans in Boston and Salem had some missionary spirit. They knew uh, that they part of their responsibility was for Native Americans. And here we have Increase Mather, who was president of Harvard University, and also supervising the work of many ministers, including Samuel Treat. And each village was to send him periodic reports to increase Mather, saying how things were developing in their own community. Uh, in each tribe of East Ham, each village, there was a Sachem or leader, and the Sachems met with Samuel during the week. They planned the scripture reading for the next Sunday and the sermons that they would each give in their own longhouse for their village or Samuel in the meeting house by the cemetery. In much later decades, towards the end of Treat's pastorate, uh, some meeting houses were established in the area separate from the long houses of the Sachems. And one of them was at the location now of the South Orleans post office. The English congregation, <clears throat> 
was required to gather in the morning and then in the afternoon for a worship service that was centered on a sermon of at least one hour. I have found no record of what those from a great distance did for lunch and rest between the services. In the mid 1800s, Thoreau wrote in the book Cape Cod, Mr. Treat is described as a Calvinist of the strictest kind, not one of those who by giving up or explaining away become like a porcupine disarmed of its quills, but a consistent Calvinist who can dart his quills to a distance and courageously defend himself. For centuries, fire and brimstone is what we call sermons that focused on hell. If there's one thing that locals here have heard about Treat, it's probably that he was full of fire and brimstone. Enoch Pratt, a later pastor in 1844 wrote, Treat was a strict Calvinist, which Dr. Freeman says is established beyond all dispute. With the advantage of preaching the doctrine of terror, which is naturally productive of a sublime and impressive style of eloquence, he could never attain the character of a popular preacher. His voice was so loud that when speaking, it could be heard at a great distance from the meeting house, even in the midst of the winds that howled over the plains of Dawson. Then and now, there are many preachers and parents and writers who use guilt to promote change, who forment now today is not at all as good as those early days when I was younger. It seems that our town hired for two generations an exquisite example of such fire and brimstone. And here's a good example as quoted by Thoreau from Jesus' parable about a rich man who did well at the table there, but went to hell. And the poor man Lazarus, who was not doing well on earth, but went after death to the bosom of Abraham. And here's Treat preaching on those two men. Thou must ere long go to the bottomless pit, you listeners. Hell hath enlarged herself and is ready to receive you. Consider, thou art going to a place prepared by God on purpose to exalt his justice in a place made for no other employment but torments. When God would show his justice and what is the weight of his wrath, he makes a hell where it shall indeed appear to purpose. Woe to thy soul when thou shalt be set up as a butt for the arrows of the Almighty. Damned sins, bitter hellish sins, sins exasperated by torments, cursing God, spite, rage, and blasphemy. The guilt of all thy sin shall be laid upon thy soul and be made so many heaps of fuel. Thus ends the example of Treat's preaching. On the other hand, we have something else happening during his pastor. In our region, and easy to see in our town uh, at Cove Burying Ground, there was a marked change in headstone art. What we see here in this image near the top of the headstone, we see death, skull, and bones. We see Jonathan Sparrow's place of rest, died in 1707. It's just near Treat's remains in that uh, burying ground. And his stone shows a fearsome, toothy skull. Woe is me, it speaks out to us. Some later headstones have artwork showing a winged head, a cherub, and verdant or paradise vegetation. This here that we're looking at is the oldest cherub with wings on Cape Cod. It's for Marcy Freeman, who died in 1711. There is also this beautiful heart surrounded by paradise and lush vegetation. Many consider it the apogee of art on Cape Cod in this era. The head of death motif became less and less selected and this head of paradise motif became ever more popular in the years after Marcy Freeman 
in the era of this burying grounds, burials from earliest East Ham to well into the 1700s, the iconography of death was shifting from skull and bones lament to a sense of heavenly paradise. So was this shift taking place in the preaching of treaty or in the minds of the deceased who left instructions or in their relatives who were commissioning the stones or the carvers creating the art? This shift started here in East Ham in the pasture of Samuel Treat. Did his preaching help parishioners move from skull and bones to a winged cherub in lush vegetation? Was the sermon I quoted an exception? And there were others speaking like this headstone to us of heaven and beauty and angels. Did his preaching future fears shift in his 45 years to preaching future hope and trust? So in this congregation in the 45 years of treaty, among God's, here we have frozen people, we have God's chosen people. And in their midst were some three older Mayflower passengers. And all these were three were buried in co-varying ground. Giles Hopkins, 65 years old when treat arrived. Joseph Rogers, 65 when treat arrived. Constance Hopkins Snow, 67, when treat arrived. We see an example here of one of their monuments, Constance Hopkins Snow, who died in 1677. These three lived and died in East Ham, in Treat's pasture. Did they melt into the crowd, into the census of 500 people when Constance Hopkins Snow died? Or did those Mayflower passengers bear a certain witness? What, if anything, did Treat learn from them? So those are my reflections on the congregation. And now a just a slight reflection on what was happening around Massachusetts. What would be happening that Treat would want to speak about? First, we're reminded here by this, of this fruit, by this fruit of Prince was the Plymouth governor from East Ham uh, when Treat arrived. He lived next door. And the pairs were ever thereafter for Treat to enjoy and to remind him of the governor. In 1675, soon after Treat arrived, was King Philip's War. Treat's mentor, Elliot, was aghast as beloved praying Indians, Natick, in chains were sent to Deer Island for almost sure death. How did this influence Treat's ministry to the Nauset, knowing of this? From 1683, his dad was governor of Connecticut. And how did this affect son Samuel? Did they visit? In 1690, there was the French military, the French war and military were needed. It was also called the King's, King William's War. And in his pastorate, the parish had to send some men to fight. Treat was surely there helping select which men would go to fight. Talk about sending people to hell. Again, also in his time in 1691, the Massachusetts Charter formally established the province of Massachusetts Bay, obliterating or merging the colony of Plymouth. How did East Ham and Treat feel about the end of Plymouth Colony. It was probably just as well that the three Mayflower passengers had died just before this. Perhaps worse, in 1692, there were the witch trials in Salem. These had to be known to East Ham and Treat. How would this have appeared in Treat's preaching? Whatever his preaching, it does not seem to have evoked the behaviors reported from Salem. And there was slavery in the local colonies. Studies have yet to unearth, to my knowledge, reports of slave ownership in East Ham. It was elsewhere in Barnstable County. It must have been here. Did treat preach on slavery. There are clear records of slavery in Truro after it became its own town 
and just after treat. For example, we have the bill of sale of slave Hector from Jonathan Payne to Benjamin Collins for 30 pounds. Payne also purchased Pop, kidnapped from Congo by a Truro whaler. With no large plantations, slaves on the Cape became very lonely. And in this case, that slave hanged himself from a tree. We all must study East Ham history more closely. Looking at the salary of Samuel Treat, here I quote Thoreau in his good humor. In 1662, East Ham agreed that a part of every whale cast on shore be appropriated for the support of the ministry. No doubt there seemed to be some propriety in thus leaving the support of the ministers to Providence, whose servants they are, and who alone rules the storms. For when few whales were cast up, they might suspect that their worship was not acceptable. The ministers must have sat upon the cliffs in every storm and watched the sh from shore with anxiety. And for my part, if I were a minister, I would rather trust to the bowels of the billows on the backside of Cape Cod to cast up a whale for me than to the generosity of many a country parish that I know. Thus wrote Thoreau. In Treat's time, for whatever reason, uh, they went to money, not whales, money for supporting this to Treat. There was no paper money yet, and few coins from England have made it here. So in, in Massachusetts, they minted local shillings, and the stated his salary was 50 pounds. At 20 shilling per pound, that would have been 1,000 of these coins each year if they could find them. A trusted source says that in today's money, that would be $12,626. He twice later received pay raises 10 pounds each time. He also got 20 acres of land beside the governor and a new house. And as much wood as he needed delivered to his door. Town meeting records show that the town provided him with other provisions for his maintenance. So. 50 or more pounds in cash coins, 20 acres in more land, a big home for his 14 children, unlimited wood and provisions, certainly better than the occasional whale. Town records show that in at least one year, even as his family grew, he gave back his salary because the town's economy sank that year. So my conclusion to this little biography is remembering the famous story of what happened as he died. An enormous blizzard, unknown in their lifetimes, hit the Outer Cape. Huge drifts uh, blocking the home where Reverend Treat died. The Native Americans heard that he had died and came in love to take his body from the home to his place of burial. And they had to dig a long tunnel through the snow drifts. And there is this image remembering that act of love by the Native Americans who he loved so much. Uh, and here we see in this next image, uh, after they buried him, they put up a stone. And here is the stone's inscription. Here lies interred, ye body of ye late learned and reverend Mr. Samuel Treat, the pious and faithful pastor of this church, who, after a very zealous discharge of his ministry for ye space of 45 years, and a laborious travel for ye souls of ye Indian natives, fell asleep in Christ, March 18, 1716, 17, in ye 69 year of his age. That uh, inscription was on his burial stone from 16 uh, years after 1700 or 17 years. There's two ways of dating that were happening in the colony at that time. So for about a hundred years, that inscription was there to remind people in East Ham about their late pastor. It was stolen by people in Orleans and they had to put up a replacement uh, stone in East Ham, much simpler without the details of the other uh, description. The earlier stone was hidden in a barn in 
uh, Orleans. Eventually, a constable found it. Uh, in the 1940s, it was put into the library in Orleans, decidedly not returned to East Ham or the cemetery. There was a big fire in the library. The Orleans Library claimed that each stone was destroyed by the fire. And many knowledgeable people at East Ham still believe that Mr. Treat's burial stone is still in hiding someplace in Orleans. A little story about the fate of uh, this great pastor. This great pastor who we see here finally again, of whom Mr. Pratt said, Mr. Treat is peculiarly entitled to a distinguished rank among the first ministers of New England in his zeal and his labors. Thank you very much for participating and listening to this presentation.